few, uh, a few things to announce. First, uh, please note this week that the Zoom office hours that I keep uh, are changing at least for the coming week and probably going forward for a while to only Mondays and Thursdays. So if you wanted to jump in to my Zoom open office hours, uh, those are the days to do it. And on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, thanks be to God, the church will just be unlocked and you're welcome to physically uh, drop in to my uh, to my office hours. Of course, you can always schedule an appointment with me outside of those hours, but uh, I'll be around at those times. Uh, another sign of things um, getting back to normal slowly but surely is that we have a uh, uh, multiplication of sign-up sheets on the uh, bulletin board in, in the parish hall um, for coffee hour. And uh, please join us for coffee hour if you're here with us today uh, after the, the liturgy. Uh, or the um, pop-up carry-in uh, for our six-month delayed annual meeting on July 18th. And now also for the provision of uh, flowers for the church, uh, again, uh, starting immediately. So if you'd like to uh, volunteer for any of those things, see the sign-up sheets in the parish hall, or contact the church office uh, when you came out. Are there other announcements? Or, oh, Paul. Yeah, I would like to, uh, uh, <laughs> representing the outreach committee, and there's a couple things that we're showing right now uh, through the Christian Clearing House and uh, to the community. The first one is the Stuff the Bus, which is July 8th, 9th, and 10th. It's at McDonald's. Uh, we're taking you know, donations of people bring in money, people bring in uh, school supplies, backpacks, uh, notebooks, calculators, pen, pencils, paper, you name it, anything to leave the school on there. And it's sort of neat now. Uh, then, uh, this one's like 6 until 7. Thursday and Friday from 10 to 2 o'clock on uh, Saturday. On Saturday, that school bus, you all know how big a school bus is. That sucker is loaded from the driver's seat to the back. It's really fantastic. And then they take it over to uh, when the church is and they, uh, they make a backpack for uh, little kids up to high school kids. So uh, any donations, if you want to be, go to McDonald's or, or bring stuff here, we can take it over there. Uh, Another thing is the, uh, for the Christian Clearing House, which is one of the organizations that Trinity uh, sponsors, and their members here again, he's real active in it. Uh, Nancy and I are and a couple of members of the parish. It's called uh, Project Captain Week. And this is uh, started by the uh, Christian Clearing House. Uh, we get some funding, we take donations, and it's a project to help kids get new shoes. See, both of these projects are sort of going back to school in the fall. And uh, we, give, we, give, we give the kids vouchers uh, for $50, and they go to uh, Kohl's Shoes and Stations for the Shoe Depot. We have the three spots that take it on there. And we generally, we help about five, 550 kids each year with new shoes for school. So uh, any donations on there is from Jenny, me or Nancy, or uh, send a check to Christian Clearing House, whatever under. Anything would be greatly appreciated on there. And this is one of the, one of the charities that uh, 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 said that Trinity Church uh, is one of the spots that are going to be back. Uh, so uh, appreciate anything you can do. Thank you.
that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy <coughs> Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Rich. In his name. 
touched my garments. And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say you touched me. And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had been done to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, he saw a tumult, and people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make tumult and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside, and took the child's father and mother, and those who were with him, and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talita Uli, which means, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and walked. She was twelve years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them <laughs> to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most of you know that we don't have cable television in the rectory, and one of the things I don't miss about the ability to stay glued to the 24-hour news cycle on cable is seeing the constant, sometimes indelicate coverage whenever a celebrity dies. It's one thing when somebody elderly dies of natural causes, like Prince Philip earlier this year, but it's often especially ghoulish when somebody goes before his or her time, whatever that really means. I suspect this was the case last year with the deaths of people like Kobe Bryant and Chadwick Boseman. Like I said, we don't have a traditional television setup, but the online sources I follow bore this out. Anyway, it's fascinating how much attention the media pays ferreting out all the gory details. And this exercise strikes me as a particularly important window into our hang-ups as a society. Now, of course, I would affirm that death happens, and it's often of little consequence precisely how. <laughs> you don't need all the gory details. But another part of me is just a little curious, uh, just like those in the media, presumably, their target audience. Maybe it's because death is such a mystery <clears throat> to us these days. We avoid thinking about it for the most part. And then when a death particularly unsettles us for some reason, whether uh, how it happened or the age of, uh, of the person to whom it happened, we try to everything we can to explain it. If we can make sense of the mechanics of a particular death, we think we can finally put to rest the notion of death. It can become a problem which our modern scientific minds have solved, and we don't have to think about it. That's what we think anyway. But then the next shocking death 
presents the whole issue anew. And just like the shocking death of however many people it ends up being in that uh, condo collapse in Florida last week. I'm sure uh, the media and we will spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what went wrong. And indeed, in this case, it's important that we do so it doesn't happen again. Um, but sometimes we don't need all the gory details. We might have figured out the mechanics. But so many of us lack a theology of death, which helps us put it in perspective. It seems to me that this problem must stem from the fact that we live in such a death-denying culture, as many of you have heard me say uh, before from this pulpit, probably ad nauseum. We can shield ourselves from the reality of death to a certain point, and we can even convince ourselves that we can avoid it. I wonder if all the exercise equipment and the drug commercials we see on television and uh, the elective surgery so many people undergo and so forth uh, prey on our inability to accept the fact that in the best case scenario, we're all going to grow old and die. Even in our Christian discourse, we don't often acknowledge the reality and profundity of death. We Christians sometimes seem to operate on this notion that, um, as some have dismissively put it, there will be pie in the sky when we die, my God. And then when the death of a loved one occurs, uh, we might not understand why it rattles us so much. Some of us may chalk it up to a lack of faith. Perhaps others even lose their faith. Ultimately, I think this internal emotional roller coaster comes from a misunderstanding of the nature of death, at least in part. Listen again to what the writer of wisdom said. God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. Through the devil's envy, death entered the world. Death, he is saying, is at least in some sense of the adoration. It wasn't part of God's initial plan, and that means that we shouldn't berate <laughs> ourselves when we find it too much to handle. Death is an effect, perhaps not scientifically, but theologically, uh, of the effect that we live in a fallen world. As St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. God's will is for life, and not only for life, but for life abundant, a life lived in his ways. Death fights against this land to a certain extent. And yet death is inescapable. The cause of the reality of our fallenness and the fallenness of the world. Death is not illusory. <clears throat> it's not a trick to test our faith, to see if we really believe in the resurrection. I remember one day in seminary, this was more than 15 years ago, when our systematic theology professor said something which became scandalous to my classmates. And I think it's because many of us weren't really listening to what he said. He said, and this is a direct quote, when you're dead, you're dead. Period. And this was upsetting, even scandalous, because uh, some of my classmates thought that our professor was denying the resurrection. Quite to the contrary, he was trying to help us understand how profound and wonderful the resurrection of the dead really is. So there's not something about us inherently which makes our souls immortal. 
The Christian view is not that we are essentially disembodied ghosts uh, animating these bodies as if they were automata. Um, and when we die, those ghosts keep on living, floating around, just like they did before. That's not the traditional Christian view. No, it's Plato's view. He had a lot of influence over Christian theology, but it's not the orthodox Christian view. And it came much later in church history. That view does ultimately deny the reality of death and turns it into an illusion. Conversely, the traditional Christian view is that death is very real. That the whole of us, body, mind, and spirit, experiences death. And there's nothing about the way we are that permits us to avoid it. Far from denying the resurrection, this makes its truth all the more wonderful. When we are dead, it's not our own nature, something about us, but God's power and grace which brings us to new life. The resurrection isn't something we just do automatically. It's a gift God gives that he brings about. Today's gospel reading, I think, makes this point. Jairus' daughter is dead, really dead. Yet Jesus knew that because of the promise of God, death was for her life and sleep. Jairus' daughter was no less dead, but her death was a period of rest and expectation. It wasn't the expectation of some automatic transmigration of her soul to a different sphere of being, but that God in Christ would literally bring her to life. And this he did. And this is our own hope for our loved ones and for ourselves. While the dead rest in peace, and while we too will enter into that sleep, we have assurance that Christ will bring us back to life fully, not as disembodied spirits, but as holy, whole, holy, incorruptible, embodied people. When at morning prayer or baptisms or funerals, or in our own private prayers, we recite the Apostles' Creed and proclaim, I believe in the resurrection of the body, we're not speaking metaphorically. The Church really does teach that there will be a bodily, physical, literal resurrection. And this is so much more comforting than the idea of just floating on clouds and playing a harp for all eternity. It's comforting and it's exciting. It means that the life of the world to come isn't contingent on anything we do or are but on the grace and creative power of God. Or to use the language of wisdom, the generative forces of the world which are wholesome. Because God created them and controlled them. And so knowing that death is real, but not the end, we can over time come to terms with it. We needn't wait for the next shocking celebrity death or a tragic occurrence to broach that topic again. And we certainly don't need to run from it or deny its reality. Rather, we are, in some sense, called to embrace death. We are commanded, I did a funeral yesterday, and this is the message I always try to communicate at funerals. That is something we all need to hear. We are commanded to love our enemies, and death is an enemy we're called to love too, as strange and difficult as that might sound. We are called to love and embrace that reality because we do not, because we do know that it is only through death that we are born to the eternal love. For even the evil of this world, death being part of it can be transformed in such a way that it accords with the ends God intends. 
All that we need to do is trust. Trust God. And to keep alive in our hearts a robust hope for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask for your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and with him, in the
and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty.